Ready? Yes. Oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. designs of crosses. Looks much more like two uh, power poles strapped together. But nevertheless, it's wooden, it's barren, it's difficult, it's heavy. And in that we can hear Jesus' words, take up your cross and follow me. And it sounds challenging, um, forbearing, like it would take all of our effort, which is really the point of the lesson. So let us pray. O merciful Lord, you, you did not spare your only Son, but the greater number for us all. Grant us courage and strength to pick up our thoughts on the call of you who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us on to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, I get to do that too? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. So, today we don't see a crowd of um, Sunday school students heading out, but next Sunday is rally day. And next Sunday, we should see a departure of students to Sunday school classes. No? Just the high school students. The other younger students are meeting in the sanctuary for opening. It's a little different right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just well, at least that's how it was before I went on vacation. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> that's where the discussion was. Okay, <laughs> so.
just the high school students will depart when it says Sunday school <laughs> next week, which is rally day. And next week, Pastor Fro and Jan will not be here because Tuesday, before God gets up, um, they depart for Kenya. I sure hope not. <laughs> well, I hope God is there. <laughs> delivered furniture. I don't trust planes anyway. For a furniture store, the owner's son, <clears throat> Roman Catholic, uh, who stopped going to morning mass, much to his mother's chagrin, when we had a delivery early morning and had to load at 7. Dennis would always tell me, I can't be there at 7. God doesn't get up till 9. <laughs> <laughs> so anything scheduled before 9 o'clock, I have kept ever since my college days as that's scheduled before God gets up. <laughs> and if they've got to be on a plane at 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning, yeah, I will call that before God gets up. <laughs> However, we know he's awake. He never slumbers nor sleeps, as the psalm yeah, tells us. But um, I didn't hear a prayer for their travel in the prayers of the church. It was forgotten. It is written down. Now. It's there. Well... Nevertheless, for us who were in early service, for all of us, let us join in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as you have protected Abraham in his travels, Mary and Joseph as they, they fled persecution, you have shown that you are with the traveler and the sojourner by whatever means, by, by car, by ship, by air. We ask you, Lord, to be with Pastor Fro and Jan as they make this trip to the International Lutheran Council meeting in Kenya, and that you would bring them also safely back to be with us, to continue to be part of our joy and our fellowship together. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. 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 Okay. <coughs> Colossians, introduction, <clears throat> introducing a book is always a lot of <laughs> lecture, a lot of reading, and we have some questions at the end in which we'll be able to discuss quite a bit, but <clears throat> we're going to read Acts 19, even though this is in Ephesus, Colossae, to whom the book of Colossians is written, is about 160 kilometers, or about 100 miles, kind of west of Ephesus. The workers that were part of Paul's entourage in Ephesus started the congregations in Laodicea, Colossae, and Derby. Um, and as we look at Colossians will also see a reference to a letter to Laodicea. Unfortunately, that was never one that was preserved as God's word and included in the scriptures, unless it happens to be the letter to the Ephesians. And We'll have to study Ephesians to answer that question. Okay. It says, read Acts 19. 
And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the island country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannius. This continued for two years, so that all the residents in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Gentiles. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant <coughs> Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus who Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sviva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through <coughs> Macedonia and Achaia and to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About the time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that only in Ephesus, but in the almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, 
and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence. She gave <coughs> all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion and they rushed together into the theater, <coughs> dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. <coughs> but when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Hermes carts, who were friends of his, sent him and were urging him not to venture into the crowd. <coughs> now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians <coughs> is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here for neither sacrilegious nor blasphemous of our gods. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with them have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro councils. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you see anything further, it shall be settled in a regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. <coughs> so, it is during this time that Paul starts the work in Coloss and Colossae. Although it is one of the shortest of Paul's epistles, Although it's one of the shortest one of Paul's epistles, uh, it contains the most profound exposition of Christology, meaning the purpose and the work of Christ in the New Testament. As is so often the case in the New Testament, this short letter is a response to distortions of the truth of Christ. This study is called the faithful disciple. Faithfulness implies the steadiness and adherence to something or someone outside oneself. St. Paul's preaching of the Christ summons us to both faithfulness, for Christ is both adherence to something, the teaching and preaching about God's work in and through Christ, and faithfulness to someone, the Christ, whose total work makes and keeps his disciples. <clears throat> As you read Acts 19, note, St. Paul had a rank, rather long ministry in Ephesus. It was during this period that a helper of Paul's evangelized the area of the Lysias Valley in which Colossae is located. His name is Epaphras. <clears throat> A careful reading of Acts 19 indicates something of the nature of the area spiritually. Acts uh, 19, 1-7 indicates that there were disciples in the area who had not grasped the full implications of the gospel of Christ. Acts 19, 8-10 shows the scope 
of Paul's activity, he continued his usual missionary pattern of preaching to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. Paul never forget that the Jews were God's chosen people and had first claim on the Christ. As was so often the case, some Jews believed, but many did not. Acts 19, 11 to 20 provides the evidence of the superstition and fear that infested the religious practices of the area. Acts 19, 21 to 40 completes the picture as one of lucrative gain for the leaders and the supporters of pagan practices. Colossae was located in Phrygia on the south bank of the river Lysias. And the main road from Ephesus to Euphrates ran through the city. Phrygia was originally part of the kingdom of Pergamum and had been bequeathed to the Roman Senate and people in 133 BC. It was then reconstructed as the Roman province of Asia, originally a wealthy and populous city. By Paul's time, it had been surpassed by Laodicea and Heropolis, two neighboring <coughs> cities. The population consisted of native Phrygians and Greek settlers, together with Jewish colonists who had fled Antiochus the Great and his persecution. It's important for us to understand the general tendencies in philosophy and thought, the thought world of the day if we understand Paul's powerful presentation of Christ. The Hellenistic Greek world reflected a strong mixture of philosophy and cult. Thought systems were often reduced to religious groups which prescribed various ceremonies, worship practices, and a certain lifestyle for the initiate who wished to belong. The short but dramatic career of Alexander the Great in conquering most of the then known world had destroyed most of the focus on social life, of social life. The city-states of the Greeks and the empire states of the ancient Orient now sought some meaning for man's life. The old gods who were guardians of the community fell from their position of worship and esteem. People began to look to deities that were universal rather than merely local deities such as Zeus, Serapis, and Helios. Worship, however, was most often directed to local heroes who uh, find men as saviors, who offered the hope of immortality. Philosophers often identified nature with God and taught that each person was part of the, that divine nature. His soul reflected this divinity. As people, however, we are not very comfortable being part of the universe. We need a social order and other people for fulfillment and a sense of purpose. Some philosophers tried to fill the void of beauty. The Stoics taught the idea of self-sufficiency. The Epicureans, the idea of impassive. <coughs> These and other philosophy, philosophical systems are ultimately an attempt to find in the mind itself a refuge from deep-seated despair. Such systems brought neither joy nor hope, but only a certain power to endure. In such a thought world, many people long for some closer touch with divinity than the universe can provide. They wanted access to a personal God. Thus a series of schools of thought developed 
that came to be known as Gnostic. It's a type of Gnostic distortion of the gospel that Paul is combating in Colossae. Paul apparently wrote his letter to Colossae during his imprisonment in Rome. Epaphras brought him word of the work of the evangelization begun in Colossae some five years earlier was being disturbed. <coughs> and it was a Gnostic heresy as its roots. The Gnostic boasted about a deeper knowledge. The Greek word for Gnostic means knowledge. That knowledge was a deeper knowledge that revealed the supposed truth about God, man, and the world. It also claimed a superior route to finding the truth. <clears throat> Ultimately, Gnosticism is a religion of self-redemption. We know little of the formal nature of the distortion in Colossae. We can infer quite a bit, however, from Paul's letter itself. <clears throat> Three elements seem to form the heresy Paul is battling. First of all, there appears to have been a strong emphasis on a profound and strange knowledge. This new teaching claimed to offer, Paul calls a tradition and a philosophy. Secondly, great stress was placed on ritual. <coughs> Great stress was laid on questions of foods, drink, festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. A third element was the ascetic self-denial. <clears throat> Paul speaks of the prescriptions of abstinence, such as handling, tasting, touching various things. He also mentions rigorous devotion, self-abasement, and severity of the body. These elements of teaching suggest that the heresy was probably Jewish in origin, combined with various Greek ideas. Particularly significant is Paul's mention of circumcision, a distinctively Jewish practice. The heart of the heresy and the great threat to the faith of the Colossians, however, lay in the doctrine of angelic beings. Paul refers to the worship of angels, to an elemental spirit of the universe. These spirits, or angelic beings, formed a sort of celestial hierarchy. Numerous titles are used for them, thrones dominions, principalities, authorities. They were taken to be mediators between man and the highest divinity. Each progressive step in knowledge brought one closer to divinity. <clears throat> taken together, they formed a panorama, the fullness, the full complement of divine activities and attributes. Since they controlled the lines of communication between God and man, all revelation from God to man, and all prayer and worship from man to God could reach its goal only through their mediation. <coughs> the Jewish aspect of this heresy was the belief that these angelic beings were the angels through whom the divine law was given. The keeping of the law was regarded as a tribute of obedience to them. The breaking of the law incurred their displeasure and brought the lawbreaker into debt and bondage to them. Hence, they must be placated not only by regular legal observances, circumcision, the Sabbath, and various sacred seasons 
and food restrictions, but also by a rigorous asceticism and self-denial. This new teaching called into question the uniqueness and greatness of the Christ. It is no myth why Paul's exposition of the cosmic universal meaning of the Christ is so explicit in Colossians. The Gnostic system was presented as an advanced teaching for the spiritually elite. Christians were urged to pursue this progressive wisdom and knowledge through a series of successive initiations until they attained perfection. Christian baptism was only a preliminary initiation. <clears throat> if people could put off all the material elements until they were transported into the spiritual world from the domain of darkness to the realm of light, this was presented as the true redemption for which they ought to aim. So, as you read the description of the thought world of Paul's day, what similarities do you see in our country and world today? Pluralism? Pardon? Pluralism? Pluralism. Yes. It's not that there's just many ways to the biblical God, but there's many ways to what? <clears throat> Fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Actualization. Salvation. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> and what do you mean there is just one God? <clears throat> or Jesus is the only way? Pluralism says, yeah, whatever you believe, that's the way. As long as you are sincere. Pardon? As long as you are sincere. So as long as you're sincere. Based on your own opinion. Yeah, pluralism of was the way of life in the Roman Empire. There were so many gods and so many philosophies competing for human allegiance. <clears throat> um, you know, so much so that, you know, Things like morality, sexual immorality, gluttony, uh, drunkenness, and all the other sins of excess, and the other um, the ways of trying to live, it didn't mean anything. Because that was part of the old gods, not part of the new gods. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, pluralism just creates eventually a vacuum of faith, a vacuum of spirituality. And um, so what connections do you see between the idea of angelic beings and the environment of faith and the age that we live in. Sounds a lot like Mormonism. Pardon? Sounds a lot like Mormonism or or Scientology or any of the other cults that basically have uh, you know secret or extra level of the, being whatever that is. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't good enough to have the free and clear gospel, but we had to stratify Christianity so that there are right. different levels of Christians and some are better than others. Yeah, you get this. Whenever we do not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden these human notions, these pagan notions come to be. 
cyber spiritual um, right. and so Scientology. Yeah. I know it started with the S. Yeah. Scientology, which is, you know, you, you go from initiate to other levels and with Scientology, you also have to pay to get to your other levels. <laughs> but you work your way up until you reach perfection. Um, there are also <clears throat> the log systems that go the same way. Now, you end up with the initiate level and you work your way up until you get to the highest level. In the Masons, that's what you end up being. Yeah, third, second degree. Yeah, um, Schweiner, etc. Um, unfortunately, we have Christian <coughs> splitters that also work that way, to which they say, "Well, they are just a believer in Jesus." but they are not a, an exemplary Christian. They are not a star Christian. Um, and then, of course, we can pick on a number of the cults. Yeah. Um, and the truth is that when faith dies, superstition takes its place. So, where do men and women seek redemption in our society when they do not know Christ? Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Harvey. There you go. Pardon? Oprah. I said Oprah, she said Steve Harvey. I like that one too, it works. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Oprah is kind of almost old, but redemption is. Well, well, what was Oprah's religion? Self. Self. Pardon? Self. Mm -hmm. Self. Mm -hmm. Self unification. Mm -hmm. yeah. Andy. They send their money to organizations to save kitty cats and doggies and elephants and such. <coughs> yes? I think another question is do people even think they need redemption? Ouch. In our society, I'm not, we don't use the word sin. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I, I think that's a question that... I think the, that's why I have redemption in quotes. Because people, people look to improving themselves. <laughs> Self-improving. Okay. Yeah. And for them, that's kind of a redemption. I'm not everything I should be. Some of the hopelessness in our society is because you look at yourself and you don't measure up. And when you don't measure up and everything you try for self-improvement doesn't work, then despair comes in. Barbara. Isn't it um, when uh, somebody feels they need to be redeemed from their behavior or their words or whatever, they look for approval from their friends, the people near them, and if they're accepted, I, well, that's okay, you, you had a bad day, blah, blah, you know, okay, so now I'm redeemed, okay, go on my way. Yeah, that looking for approval from others and if you don't get it, then... You still feel like a dog. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, any similarities um, to the um, situation that you've heard about Colossae? Well, there's... There's still groups out there that are telling people we have special knowledge. We, if you want to be better 
person, we can help you get there. Right. But you're going to need to pay. Yes. I mean, some of them are socially accepted, advertised in the media. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, and compared to Colossi, it's kind of that stoic self sufficiency. Um, or that you get excited about things that do not have real substance, that really don't take change. Um, and, oh, um, It's okay because you did that because you you do what you have to do. Yeah, which is kind of replaced the old thing of keeping your cool. Mm -hmm. And it's now, okay, you did what you had to do. It's an attempt um, to find a place in the mind where you overcome that deep-seated despair. Uh, and, yeah, okay. <laughs> what? Wasn't me. <laughs> okay. An attention getter. Uh, we live in a great period of, of blame. You know, I want to be a certain person, but it's somebody else's fault that I can't be. Who? Or an organization or right. something. It's always something out there. It's not me. Right. <coughs> uh, pick out and discuss some of the contemporary Christian cults <coughs> or distortions that you can think of that have similarities to the Colossian error. Pastor? Yes. In our hometown, Bethel Church in Reading. Amen. Special knowledge. Yep. Oh, yeah. Special yes. activities, special knowledge. Be the super Christian. Don't be one of those regular Yes. One of the real Christians. The sinners. Yeah, yeah in the Redding, sinners. California. Bethel Church often makes the news because of the special knowledge. And if you are special enough with the special knowledge, you can even raise the dead. <laughs> one of their friends. Serious? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. <coughs> yeah. And they send some of their super apostles down the coast to California to perform healings and miracles and, yeah. Really? And they've basically yeah. taken over that town. Pardon me? They've basically mm -hmm. taken over the entire town. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. Mormons in Salt Lake City, somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> well, we can say the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it's amazing how little control they have over Salt Lake City itself anymore, other than having a temple there. I mean, the Gentiles have so invaded um, <laughs> the state of Utah that, you know, you just have certain enclaves that are still strictly warm, particularly in the southern part of the state. However, Zion Mercantile Investments is a major corporation controlling many, many businesses, including a hotel chain that I won't name. Um, but, yeah. Um, and you have to be among the faithful. Yeah. There's another cult other than the 
Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, that you work your way into sure. your own salvation. Why not? <laughs> Similar to the Colossian error. Jehovah's Witnesses. <clears throat> you know, you don't want to abuse the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because, no, they get more points if you abuse them. <laughs> you do, you set them on the face and they get them higher. Why? Yeah. That gives them more points to be higher. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, be polite to them, but be polite to dismiss them to get them out of your life. But you don't just abuse them. Yeah. You can say you're happy being part of the Church of Jesus Christ, the true church, um, your faithful member there, um, and no, you're not interested in what they want to hand you or give you or etc. Yeah. Have a nice day. Yes. Yeah, we've already met, uh, dealt with that. Anybody familiar with the way? With what? That was the way. The way. You know, they took their name from Acts 19. Christians were first known as the way, and now there is a cult called the way. Whereabouts are they typically located? Because I don't remember running into them. You know. The way? Yeah. Oh, the way is kind of all around. When we started Holy Cross, the way used to meet in the old bowling alley. And now there is a chapter of the way um, in uh, Sacramento. Um, for a while, they were kind of, they had a group that was active at Springview School. Um, they'd like to come in saying that they're interested in helping the youth in the community. And then pretty soon you find out they're a cult. Um, and they again are teaching people a way of self-salvation. Yeah, really. So, last question. Before we get into the book proper next week, according to Paul, how does Christ help us communicate with the Father? And what comfort does that give? <clears throat> All of you know um, All of you know the Bible verse that that question is based on. Ask in my name and it will be given Pardon? to you. Ask in my name and it will be given to you. Ask in my name and it will be given to you. That's another one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 14, 6. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And why don't you look Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. chapter 4. with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence 
draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. So, no one comes to the Father but by me. What do we have here? We have the image of Jesus the High Priest. You know, God, man, lived a life here on earth just like us. So would you really, really love it? And you need forgiveness. Guess what you have going on in the spiritual realm? Advocacy. You have a high priest. You have Jesus hearing your prayer. I mean, I don't, don't hang me for this image. So there's Jesus. He hears your prayer. And he, you know, because he has this phone that has all your pictures on it. Mm -hmm. uh, he then goes up to God the Father. And he says, look at this picture of John Paul. You see this little one who really blew it? I died for him. That's what this Hebrews 4 is giving you, is giving you the image of Jesus taking your sins, presenting them to the Father, and saying, this is one for whom I died, and then turning around and handing you a white robe of forgiveness. Yes. <laughs> we don't need angels, mediums, gems, stones, powers to connect to the upper realms. We have Jesus. And with Jesus, we have everything we need. Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you now have given us the opportunity to look at the background, to look at the thought ways, so that when we read those words that you give to us in the word, book of Colossians, that we can hear it with a sense of knowing that you give us a full portrait of Jesus, the one who is with you from eternity, the one who has been with you at the foundation of this earth, and the one who we will see face to face one day. Let us go in your peace and your joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.